Hello, good uh, evening. Welcome to Bergen Kunsthal, to the first uh, platform event uh, this season in the new year. Uh, welcome. Uh, we have a talk tonight in our series platform with Wong Bing Hao, a writer, editor and mediator based in uh, Singapore. Uh, Wong Bing Hao works on research and public programs that explore artists and their practices and visual culture in a more general sense towards discovering new lexica for queerness as it is described in a text by Bing called Visualizing Intersectionality. And the talk today is part of our series of events in relation to our current exhibition with uh, Sandra Mujinga, Shadow of New Worlds, uh, which is ending actually this uh, Sunday. And we invited um, Bing initially, since they produced also a text for the book that we are currently working on um, about the show, which is uh, finalized in a few weeks. We were, in all honesty, uh, hoping to have it finished by today, but um, the holidays uh, took their toll. Um, in the talk today, uh, um, Bing will focus on some specific aspects in the exhibition, mainly the body, both human and non-human, and its significance beyond uh, the usual uh, binary encodings. The talk will specifically look at the political meaning of surfaces, as in the skin, our covers that are explicitly addressed in Sandra Mujinga's hollow figures in the exhibition, but also in the notion of pop culture and its fascination with appeal and appropriation. Why are bodies, uh, why are bodies adored? And can idolization can be a reflective act attuned to cultural contexts and urgencies. And further keywords that Wong Bing Hao has promised to discuss include K-pop, social media apps, the growing consciousness around transgender issues, cute theory, cult celebrities, fashion, and theories of the self. To introduce the speaker uh, in a bit more detail, as I said, um, they are a writer, editor, and mediator. They studied art history in London and are currently based in Singapore, working with different organizations, amongst others, the National Gallery. Their writing appeared in media such as Art Forum, Freeze, and Leap, and they're editing a series of online publications that aim to generate new research trajectories and communities around contemporary artists of non binary and trans experience. And among these are two that have um, uh, been published already. Uh, Indifferent Idols in 2018 and Nominal Bliss 2019, and I think we'll hear a bit about um, these in the talk. There will be two more forthcoming in 2020 to 2021. Uh, before we start with the talk proper, uh, I wanted to announce two more uh, events that we have coming up this week, and which uh, conclude the series of events um, around uh, Sandra Mojinga's exhibition. Uh, the first one on Saturday, uh, 18th of January at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, a performance, Declaration of Independence, with Barbie Asante and many amazing collaborators. And this event is the result of a workshop we hosted here in December. And then at uh, 11 o'clock, 23, uh, here at Landmark, uh, DJs uh, Raps and Barbie Asante, uh, who uh, come from the workshop and will uh, bring some th South London dance floor into the space. Uh, a few technical remarks. Um, the talk will take around 40, 45 minutes. Um, and afterwards, we have uh, an opportunity for a, short, a couple of short questions. And uh, to ask these, I have a microphone. Because second, I want to mention that uh, this talk is as many um, events in our series platform uh, live streamed. So there are two cameras. One is here and one is up there. So if you uh, feel uncomfortable being filmed. Um, I think the safest position is uh, in the corner where uh, Jan is currently placed. Um, but no worries, we're all friendly people. And uh, I welcome um, Bing. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much for uh, speaking to us today. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Hi. Uh, thanks so much Axel and the entire Bergen Kunsthalle team for making this happen. Um, and thank you to Sandra for inviting me in the first place. And um, we've actually never met, so this is kind of interesting. Um, but one day, hey. <laughs> um, so, um, 
and thanks everyone for coming. I know it's like it's very cold and very late in the year. So um, please bear with me. And today I'm I'm just kind of like presenting an expanded version of a paper that I first presented in Sydney um, last year at a conference called Gender in Southeast Asian Art Histories. So it's looking at like the digital and like canon making. Um, so this is like an expanded version and research that I was thinking around artistic practice and Sanja was one of those artists who I think the work really spoke to. Um, yeah, it's actually titled Sweetie, which is like um, the most demeaning insult ever. So I'm very excited to, to share it with you. Okay, so I'm just going to start reading. because um. In November 2018, KDA debuted as a K-pop group with their hit single, Pop Stars, which now has over 260 million views on YouTube. KDA are not, however, just another regular addition to a burgeoning music industry. They are, in fact, a, quote, virtual K-pop girl group, a digital fiction entirely fabricated by Riot Games, an American video game developer, for their fantasy battle game, League of Legends. So I'm just going to play a short clip. Uh, oh, oops. Uh, this is actually a clip of their... It's a clip of like a concert. It's kind of interesting. Wait, how do I play this? Okay, so basically it's like um, the avatar and the voice actors at the same time. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, so KDA's fictional members, Ari, Evelyn, Kaisa, and Akali, are voiced by Mion and Soyeon, members of the successful new K-pop girl group, Idol, and American singers, Madison Beer and Jaira Burns, who incidentally both found initial career success by uploading videos of cover songs onto YouTube. Each KDA avatar is styled in a unique blend of human, animal, and other non-human features. For example, Ari has a fox-like tail and ears, and Evelyn has um, razor-sharp claws and like kind of scorpion stingers. And Kaiser wears futuristic mechanical wings on her back, and Akali dons a mask with animalistic fangs. Complementing their distinctive visuals are equally personalized biodata like birthdays, zodiac signs, blood types, height, weight, etc. Uh, skills and talents. So for instance, Akali is a proficient martial artist. Kaisa can speak four different languages. And lastly, even personality and character traits. So for instance, um, Evelyn had beef with Ari and left the group for a solo career. And after five years of having a girly image, Ari is now going for a more high fashion and elegant look. KDA's members are marketed as conceptually new, cutting edge, unprecedented digital idols. On their Spotify profile, Ari proclaims that KDA's songs remind fans to, quote, always be true to themselves. Specialness notwithstanding, KDA's members still conform to certain industry types and standards. As the bold, capitalized title of their debut single, Pop Stars, attests, they are the definit definitive pop stars. For example, despite their outlandish and futuristic looks, the members of KDA are still conventionally judged and ranked according to their abilities and aesthetic appeal. They are each assigned K-pop group positions. So for instance, Ari is both the main vocalist who perennially gets the most airtime in a song and the visual of the group, 
the most attractive by Korean beauty standards. And Akali is the designated maknae, which is the youngest member of the group. Despite enabling the creation of hybrid idols with distinctive personalities and lives, digital technology in its usage here has yet to depart from the structural and subjective regulations of the real world. In her study of women's health mobile phone applications, Maria, Marisa Doshi similarly observes the prominence of three types or idealizations of the healthy woman, and she calls these the Barbie, the earth goddess, and the entrepreneur. While this newfangled technology appears to empower women with, with agency in the confident reclamation of their bodies and lives, Doshi argues that they in fact, quote, retrench traditional discourses and harmful stereotypes about women's bodies by reinscribing racial and class privileges that envision a healthy female subject as one who is unencumbered by these material conditions. That is to say, white, skinny, heterosexual, cisgender, middle class, etc. For Doshi, gendered digital embodiments produced by women's health apps remain narrow and unreflective of lived experiences and infirmities. Similar contradictions are apparent in popular social media apps like Facebook, Instagram, and, and Snapchat, which have generated what David Bell in early Web 2.0 days would call the preemptive prosumer, who capitalizes on these increasingly democratized platforms by actively creating their own personalized profiles and pages. Conversely, critics have argued that these apps have in fact reduced creative potential by offering only preset templates that are deceptively customizable. That is to say that the prosumer can only go rogue within certain fixed parameters and standardized frameworks of peer networks. Similar arguments have been rehearsed since the early days of user-generated Web 2.0 platforms like MySpace, Friendster, and Blogspot. In her reading of French artist Camille Enrault's video work, Gross Fatigue, Cadence Kinsey demystifies this seemingly what she calls non-hierarchical, lateral, capricious, subjective, and intuitive organization of information on the World Wide Web, as suggested in Horror's video. Instead, Kinsey contends that the invisible, or what she calls the underlying forms of determination, such as algorithms, mediate the semblance of idiosyncrasy, and presently puppeteer the subject in front of the computer screen. For Kinsey, quote, the subject produced in front of the screen must be understood not simply as autonomous and hyper-individualistic, but as constituted through a dynamic between autonomy and automation. Walking into a lightless gallery in Sandra Mojinga's exhibition, Shadow of New Worlds, it takes a few minutes for eyes to adjust to the pitch blackness. Entering from galleries lit with green light, red is the overwhelming retinal after image. In the absolute darkness, senses of perspective and depth are momentarily flamoxed. Slowly, eyes familiarize themselves to the singular source of illumination, flow. Sandra Mujinga's new artwork that is affectionately named after her mother. Flow is a three meter tall hologram modeled after Anne-Marie Crooks, a Jamaican-American former bodybuilder and pro wrestler. Flo is, <clears throat> excuse me, Flo is clad in an elephantine black full leather suit and is only visible in momentary flashes throughout the darkened exhibition space. They appear as soon as they emerge. They disappear as soon as they emerge, an elusive holographic presence. In Flo's brief appearances, their bodily features are scantily identifiable. Only a nebulous skeletal physique outlined in green can be deciphered. Slow movements disperse Flo's tangibility further, making it more difficult to lock down a definite physicality. A haunting soundtrack of string instruments accompanies Flo's ghostly ephemeral intrusions into the exhibition space. Unlike the holograms of deceased celebrities like Tupac and Whitney Houston, which are spotlighted in popular revival concerts, Flo does not seem to be concerned with the business of 
self-preservation, longevity, or self-aggrandization. Instead, reminiscent of Crook's enigmatic ring name, Midnight, flow is the virtual embodiment of a potent liminal darkness, a bodybuilder's hard-earned musculature fragmented, dissolved, and rendered intangible. Looking down at the floor in the other galleries of Bergen Kunsthalle, plexiglass screens printed with grayed images of foliage and propped up in a handicapped manner seem to function as subterranean filters that shield and camouflage the digital videos underneath. Peaking askance or with bent hip, the video content of dancers moving intuitively in dramatically sleeved costumes can just be made out. These works, titled Stretched Delays, create an ecology where landscape and subject are warped. These artworks by Sandra prompt fruitful questions about her intuitive and nuanced representational strategies. What is a real body, and where does it begin and end? With flesh, bones, and guts that breathe and decay, or possibly in other diffuse, inchoate, and mediated forms, how can the destabilization of a, quote, real body be carefully mobilized towards more productive ends? Regarding the construction of cyber subjectivities, new media scholars have long argued that cyberspace, lavished with its professed freedoms and fluidities, in fact often paradoxically reproduces IRL or offline in real life discriminations and hierarchies of power. Multiple user online domains founded as early as the 1970s offer a plethora of options for anemic, deskbound users to exoticize themselves. Simply type in your desired personal statistics, age, race, gender, body type, etc., and your avatar comes to life. Electronic text and digital code are the ultimate enablers of subjectivity. These supposedly liberating and open milieu do, however, have a dark side. Cultural difference can become a, quote, costume or masquerade to be donned and discarded without consequence or real disenfranchisement, as Lisa Nakamura details in what she calls identity tourism. In Nakamura's study, the large majority of people who present themselves online as East Asian caricatures, uh, for example, samurai warrior Bruce Lee, geishas, um, are white. Does the technological utopianism of the internet flatten differences or perpetuate them? Answering this rhetorical question, Wendy Chun surmises that this problem often falls back onto what she calls the discriminated rather than the discriminators to alleviate. What of those who live through these contingencies and oppressions in the real world? Can race be similarly treated as a flimsy mask to be peeled off at a whim? I'm interested um, in these kind of theoretical impossibilities. In an analogous case study, Alika Rosenstone documents the popular phenomenon of gender role play on the internet in which users frequently create online avatars with genders other than their own. So for example, a heterosexual, able-bodied man projected himself as a bisexual, disabled woman online. In her analysis of this popular online activity, Stone challenges the widely accepted cultural belief in a true self that is grounded in a single physical offline body. That is to say, a real body in the real world. Via roleplay, a sovereign self is splintered as it is projected in different and unrecognizable forms online. When users perform as genders or fabricated characters foreign to them, their online personae can become so believable that they even develop what Stone calls a quasi-life of their own, separate from their embodied life in the real world. In extreme cases of this um, slippage, on and offline selves can even potentially merge as multiple vitalities compete for agency of the um, supposed authentic self. In her essay, Habits of Leaking of Sluts and Network Cards, Wendy Chun analyzes a case of sexual assault that went viral. Explicit pictures of an Irish woman who attended an Eminem concert were posted on the internet and social media. 
In media coverage of the incident, Chun notes the, quote, remarkable slippage where it was left unclear as to whether the woman's hospitalization was due to the sexual violation or the image circulation of the sexual violation. Elsewhere in her analysis of vampire LARPs or live action role playing games, Alvia Wilk um, theorizes the inevitable bleed via vampiric bite, the quote crossover between player and character where game bleeds into real life and vice versa. For Wilk, the disturbance of subjective core via bleed is not to be frowned upon, but rather it it presents the, quote, mutability of infinite possible selves without fearing loss of the self among them. Likewise, for Chun, the acrimonious insult of a promiscuous slattiness sees as its flip side the radical vulnerability to be open, to loiter online, and to acknowledge the multitude of exchanges online. Sherry Turkle argues that the schizophrenic assortment of online personalities contributes to what she calls a reconsideration of traditional unitary notions of identity and disturbs the assumption of a stable subject. The innocence of the self, the I that is umbilically bound to an emplaced body that is conceived of as constant, unchanging and stable is hurled out with the virtuality of cyberculture which, as Stone argues, signposts the change that has come over the relationship between the sense of self and the body. The irrevocable verity of a body's fleshiness, its corporeal reality, is no more. In a motion toward infidelity, the vow between self and body is broken. In other words, cyberspace radically alters our perception of real bodies, i.e. physical, tangible, offline, and the nexus of authentication. Cyberspace is as legitimate an environment for bodily presence, sociality, and community formation as much as the real world. For all this talk of porosity and openness mediated by technology as interface, Stone is also quick to caution that, quote, not all realities are equal. Accusations of inappropriate behavior online and IRL have vastly different consequences. For example, the justice system would more likely apply to the latter scenario. And needless to say, getting wounded in an RPG or a role player game is not anywhere near the same as sustaining a flesh wound. As Stone ruminates, no matter how virtual the subject may become, there is always a body attached. A return to the body as it is lived and felt is inevitable. These are important conclusions for the communities gathered by Sandra's and my own practice. Art is put in the service of reality and world making. Collaborators and people who are depicted in Sandra's artworks are purposefully incognito, portentous, invisible, slippery, ungraspable, but still consequential, felt, kindred, and diamond bright. In her practice, Sandra abstracts the particularity of the particular without jettisoning a core of morality and accountability to her collaborators and communities. Something like what Rosie Bridotti calls um, a sustainable subjectivity, an admonishment for the necessity and responsibility of imposing limits on itinerancy and transgressions. Through her works, Sandra proposes a critical subterfuge to metamorphose and shapeshift according to the demands of context. While access to the works is without question, certain possibilities thrive um, with uh, other protections. Um, in June 2014, four years before KDA's debut, Actress Laverne Cox made history by becoming the first openly transgender person to grace the cover of Time magazine, heralding transgender as um, America's next civil rights frontier. According to Susan Stryker and Aaron Azura, transgender as an identity and cultural phenomenon have become exponentially popularized since the early 1990s, thanks in no small part to the corresponding popularity of the World Wide Web.
In our current decade, the visibility of transgender in popular consciousness, culture, and media has been amped up to the max, and trans people can be seen everywhere, in TV shows, Hollywood movies, fashion billboards, even your daily social media feeds, and in K-pop. Lee Kyung Eun, more famously known as Harisu, a transliteration of the English term hot issue, has truly lived up to her stage name. Since first gaining public attention in 20, uh, 2001 in a television commercial for the Korean company Dodu Cosmetics, Harisu launched her moderately successful acting and music career and has been dubbed Korea's first transgender idol. Details of her personal life, including her marriage, divorce, and transition, have been openly documented and have arguably received greater attention than her professional activities. So this is a uh, kind of cosmetics video. Harisu has used her limited celebrity to publicly advocate for trans people in Korea, having spoken out on social media against transphobic comments made by other K-pop insiders. She even covered surgical costs for a Chinese trans woman who couldn't afford them, and she legally changed her name, making her allegedly the only, only the second person in Korea's history to do so. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Harisu's celebrity hinges on a glamorous, feminine, and passable appearance, i.e. appearing indistinguishable from a cisgender woman, or embodying palatable and favorable modes of Korean femininity. A random Google search of her stage name yields an array of agio or cute and baby face selfies, Lux fashion spreads, sultry promotional photographs, and the predictable before and after transition photos that are meant to shore up binary notions of gender and illustrate how different, unrecognizable, feminine, and passable Harisu looks now. Harisu even went so far as to consider getting a uterus transplant so she could bear children with her ex-husband, but decided against it as she would have to be bedridden for one to two years after the procedure for it to be successful. I argue that Harisu performs what Elizabeth Wissinger calls glamour labour, the on and offline work on one's self-image. Through cosmetics, social media filters, physical conditioning, mobile apps, surgeries, and up-to-date accoutrements, Harisu works to, quote, both project a fashionable image and to be that image in the flesh. So this is um, Wissinger. She is both a virtual and corporeal idol. What does it mean for someone like Harisu to embody acceptable and aspirational forms of prettiness, sex appeal, and femininity? Does her sleek gender presentation presumably evacuate any possibility of critical reflexivity, potency, or ambivalence? Nothing disarms quite like cuteness. It is arguably f the affective state that is least seriously considered. For Simon May, cuteness is often perceived as, um, so I'm going to list, um, trivial, powerless, innocuous, and infantile distraction, cuddly, comforting, and most certainly not a worthy in subject of investigation. Cute is a minor category, rem reminiscent of the ancillary or awkward place of gender and sexuality in art history. Foregrounding female-identified cultural workers in Southeast Asia, Eline Legaspi Ramirez writes about their work and art that has been left um, by what she calls on the back burner, and how patronizing interpretations of their practices often, quote, slice out the gender question away from notions of art practice. Conversely, because it is so easily underestimated, cute with a capital C, like other gendered work and affects, 
is capable of satirizing and mocking the value we attach to power, as well as our assumptions about who has power and who doesn't. Cute is something indeterminate, unpindownable, superficial, uncanny and knowing, albeit in a playful register, which explains why cute objects like Hello Kitty, instant messaging stickers, anime characters, emojis and K-pop idols often blur age, gender and human non-human lines, reminding us that there is, quote, no endearing, stable being. And to be clear, I use superficial as a superlative. Um, Xian Nai argues that because cuteness is an aestheticization of powerlessness, passivity, and weakness, violence is, quote, always implicit in our relation to the cute object. The cute object can either bite back or be at the receiving end of brutality. Steering clear of sensational, uh, sensational, sensationalized or macabre narratives, I often privilege readings of beauty and aesthetic in artworks by transgender and gender non-conforming artists, and theoretically I look at how to weaponize an aesthetic of saccharine cuteness as ameliorating self and shield as a way to revise phobic assumptions about trans people. Pretty, cute, and sexy can be protective and ennobling, not prohibitive archetypes. Likewise, Kylie May, an indigenous trans woman and interlocutor for Eliza Steinbock's research, asserts that her, quote, selfies are legit. They are a survival tool that help her to feel more in control of her image and a greater sense of self-worth. Discussing Artist Amelia Oman's 2014 Instagram artwork, Excellences and Perfections, which comprises a series of selfies and lifestyle documentations on Instagram, Cadence Kinsey argues that Oman performs pretty as normalizing principle or ideology that is violently exclusionary in both social and technological terms. This is quite similar to Harisu, whose historical and cultural context Self-representations and motivations seem far removed from Elika Rosenstone's 1987 manifesto for post-transsexuality, a, quote, counter-discourse that urges trans people to forego passing, to be consciously read as transgender, rather than seek the social validation of gender realness. Stone's post-transsexual salvo politicizes and legitimizes visibly trans and non-binary subject positions. And to be clear, um, while I find both propositions productive in my work, I have focused um, in this presentation on elaborating the power of like trans beauty quotient. As a Korean trans woman, Harisu bodies forth a challenge to Wissinger's universalizing theory that fails to account for cultural particularities and differences. Interestingly, in media interviews, Harisu has publicly voiced her ambivalence toward being interpolated as transgender, disliking the label while acknowledging its centrality in propelling her to stardom. Discussing Harisu within the framework of Korean cosmetic and media industries after the so-called 1997 IMF crisis, Patty Ahn argues that Harisu's tentative and complicated self-identification, quote, shatters wholly celebratory arguments, predominantly coming from the West, about Korea's symbolic sexual progress. And the same critiques can be leveled against transgenders, um, new hypervisibility and statistic inclusivity. Um, as the editors of Trapdoor, Transcultural Production and the Politics of Visibility, um, which is a recent anthology um, that analyzes the phenomenal proliferation of transculture, um, self reflexively admit that their book is, quote, geopolitically limited, as the majority of contributions come from and are about the United States. Responding to these shifting scenarios, I'm interested in asking how this heightened cultural consciousness, these hot issues mainly experienced in North America, translate, if at all, to regional and transnational contexts, and by what alternative registers can cultural and gender difference be measured.
let's talk about the Juicy Couture tracksuit. In 2000, I was, you know, New York socialite. I was modeling, I was doing my thing. I loved to go out. The 2000s were all about Britney Spears, boy bands. It was all about monogram and labels, like Chanel and Dior and Louis Vuitton. And I feel like everybody just had really fun with their fashion choices. So I think it was just all about being super extra. In this video, hotel heiress and 2000s socialite Paris Hilton proclaims her love for pink, saying that she has always been obsessed with wearing lots of pink and sparkles, a lot of Swarovski crystals, anything that was bright and stood out. With her apathetic vocal fry and pleasantly lackadaisical attitude, Hilton discusses her time on the 2000s reality TV show The Simple Life, in which her and then bestie Nicole Richie left behind their exorbitant LA luxuries for a more frugal existence in small American towns, where they were assigned day jobs and lived in homestays. The off-kilter duo often made light of their strange predicament and the small town lifestyle, or lack thereof, often failing miserably at simple tasks and creating laughable and chaotic situations in otherwise mundane work and family environments. Just a few weeks ago in December 2019, Hilton interviewed pop star Kim Petras backstage at the 9th Annual YouTube Streamy Awards, where she expressed support for the transgender singer and hinted at an upcoming music collaboration. Another cult celebrity, Pamela Anderson, the Canadian-American actress best known for her appearances in Playboy magazine and as a busty lifeguard, in the 1990s Baywatch television series. From 1998 to 2002, Anderson starred in VIP, a short-lived, moderately popular American dramedy TV series. And um, she starred as Valerie Irons, a famous ambassador for a bodyguard agency, Valerie Irons Protection, or VIP. Irons is backed up by a team of expert investigators in prime physical condition, ex-CIA and FBI agents, martial artists, and a computer whiz, all of whom are interestingly women and or racially diverse. Comparatively clumsy and inept, Valerie Irons' strongest assets are her charm and sincerity, which help her to solve crimes and triumph over the bad guys, all while dressed in silver rompers, feather boas, pink lingerie, and platform heels. Fast forward to December 2018, the longtime animal rights activist and sex symbol surprised many with a string of eloquent tweets about class politics in relation to the Yellow Vest protest in France, where she currently resides. Anderson thinks that, quote, activism is sexy, but the verdict is still out on whether this is a ditzy or authentic sentiment. The queen of indifference has to be Mariah Carey, who is my personal idol. Um, Mariah has come under unfair scrutiny in recent years for her diva mentality, which is a well-earned badge of honor, and her can't-do attitude. She made headlines in 2017 during her headlining Vegas residency, The Butterfly Returns, when she seemed to be supremely over it on stage. Mariah has been celebrated in memes and fan theories for doing the absolute least and avoiding what she would call a, quote, bleak moment. The elusive chanteuse rightfully preserves her mystique. In this brief presentation, I have tried to explore what, why, and how bodies are adulated, arguing for the significance of superficiality, cuteness, beauty, and prettiness. Seemingly indifferent, glassy-eyed idols like Mariah, Pam Anderson, Harisu, and Paris Hilton are, I speculate, attuned to certain ambiguities and urgencies of their cultural context. In my recent work, I foreground gender and the digital as methodologies to think otherwise, as Amelia Jones might say, to a regional art history that is too often considered within certain binary or reductive frameworks. Methodologically, I draw from Madhavi Menon's important book, Indifference to Difference on Queer Universalism, 
in which she critiques identity and intersectional politics by arguing that our desires and lived realities are too, quote, multiple to abide by a code of identitarian difference. Menon proposes instead a politics of indifference to identity, one that is neither apathetic nor ignorant of, quote, contingent material circumstances, but refuses rather to make cultural and somatic differences the basis on which to formulate and navigate the truth of identity. Likewise, universalism does not jettison particularities or ontological categories, but rather, quote, demands that we acknowledge the fact of our restless movement among them. Therefore, an indifferent universalism from Menon is queer not because it has anything to do with an identity that we can understand as queer, but precisely because, like universalism, queerness too is marked by a desire that refuses the contours of a fixed body, end quote. Um, and to kind of conclude, I want to discuss a series of um, online publications that I have developed. Um, Basically, the, the publications really um, are created around artistic practice. So I work with an artist and, you know, through a kind of long-term endeavor, we think about the practice and um, then I commission writers, cultural practitioners and other artists to kind of contribute texts that I feel are um, relevant to think about the artist's practice and to think in a more expansive way about their work. And so the series really aims to produce um, a new kind of research trajectory and new communities around an artist's practice, especially artists who identify as non-binary and trans. Um, so for instance, this is the newest one. It's called Nominal Bliss. And um, the publications are designed by Studio Vanessa Ban, who um, Vanessa is a designer based in Singapore, and um, um, this one was kind of working around a Singapore artist Nora Lea's work. And um, as part of the publications, we often also find it really important to kind of program and engage with certain publics, whether it's through workshops or like commission performances or. Um, just like artist talks. So um, this one has contributions from Bermiet Borobaeva when she's thinking about different ideas of transness like translation, transcultural, transnational, um, transgender, and then um, Freddy was kind of um, a text uh, from his PhD thesis that is unpublished um, on like trans women and gender non-conforming people in Sharia states in Indonesia. And, you know, Bermiet was kind of talking about her um, research in terms of like food conservation as a migrant cultural worker from Kazakhstan living in Moscow. So there are different kinds of like transness that we were hoping to explore. And um, through the publications, we're really thinking about like creating um, a discursive element to artist practice. And the artists are often also like writers themselves. So they contribute text. So I think that's the kind of end of my presentation. And thanks for like sitting through the whole thing. <laughs> um, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh sure, oh my god, so enthusiastic. I thought it was gonna be like a long wait. Um but um so actually we it's interesting because someone else recently asked that question. Um I think uh, this was uh someone who had a publishing house. So obviously they go through the publishing house or go through kind of more formal frameworks. But for us, it's really like me and the artist and the designer. So <laughs> it really is just like dependent on our networks. And I think the idea of like distribution and applicability of the work is really important because um, one of the reasons why I that was really one of the reasons why I switched from like a kind of exhibition model to this kind of online publications was because it was a very practical, very easy to do and um, easy to kind of make our intervention 
but then we were really worried because it was just dependent on like individual networks. Um, but so far, actually, the response has been really great. So for the first publication, it's called Indifferent Idols, um, which uh, was kind of created around um, Victoria's Sins practice. Um, that one, within a month, we had 800 readers online with average of like 21 minutes, which means that you can read the whole thing. And then after like two months, I think we had like 1,200 or something. So this one, actually, I haven't checked with Vanessa about <laughs> what the response is. But I think that is, in fact, it's like comparable or in fact more um, impressive than when I was doing exhibitions, actually. So I feel like the distribution, although we can't really track for sure how engaged people are, but it's like kind of a good indicator that the publications are like well received as a format. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, maybe one quick uh, question or comment uh, from me, which is, uh, you mentioned in the in uh, the beginning that you uh, haven't uh, met actually in person Sandra, uh, but uh, you actually communicated uh, you, you a lot with her through Instagram or something like uh, other instant messaging uh, applications. And uh, uh, it was interesting to work with Sandra. We noticed, or she's also like uh, very open communicating about uh, the fact that uh, a lot of people that she works with, that she follows and uh, that are important for her work and uh, for a discussion around her work, uh, she establishes actually contacts uh, through the through digital channels without necessarily uh, meeting uh, people in person and I wonder I mean, it, it, it relates in a way uh, to your talk as well to uh, um, but it was kind of it was fascinating to to observe how what, what kind of practical realities that actually creates uh, is this uh, something that uh, happens to you a lot as well? That um, working relationships establish uh, uh, in digital realms? Yeah, like absolutely. So, like for instance, Sandra and I, we've I think we first got in touch through a friend, um, Kabi, who's a Malmo-based artist, and we were put in touch about two years ago, like two and a half years ago, and then we just like follow each other. And then I, I reached out to kind of write a response to her work in 2018. This was her show at UKS. And then this year she, well, this past year, she asked me to kind of like write the text. And then now we're kind of working in this way. So yeah, we actually haven't met. And with a lot of the artists that I work with, we seldom meet. Um, like Victoria, for instance, we met. We didn't meet in London, like our paths didn't cross. Um, but it was through friends and through cultural practitioners who we both know that um, ended up like I commissioned, I was commissioned to write about their work and then we follow each other and then we like follow the practice. And then last year when I had a residency in Taipei at the Taipei Contemporary Art Centre, that's when I invited them to come over for a residency and you know then the, the kind of relationship is really reciprocated. So yeah, there are certain key meeting points where we have to meet to like kind of develop that relationship to like see the work and like, you know, experience the work in person. But most of it is like online, like social media stuff. So. We can talk later. <laughs> yeah, yes, um, no question, then maybe we um, head over to the bar. Yeah. Thank I you so much uh, <laughs> for the presentation. Thank you. Being Thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for like, staying. <laughs> <laughs>